Good afternoon again, and welcome to our final session of today, day one of the CLC conference. This afternoon, we will be hearing from Dr. Tiffany Neal, PhD, and Dr. Naomi Sweezy, PhD, HSPP. They are each with Hands on Autism Interdisciplinary Training and Resource Center and the, I'm sorry, Department of Psychiatry at the IU School of Medicine. This session is titled Bridging the Autism Service Chasm, Implementation of a Coordinated Care Continuum for Patients with the Most Significant Behavioral Health Challenges. First, I will introduce to you Dr. Sweezy. Dr. Sweezy is a professional, I'm sorry, professor of clinical psychology and clinical psychiatry at the Indiana University School of Medicine. As founder of the Hands and Autism Model and the director of the Hands and Autism Center, her programming and research interests include the facilitation and implementation of systems change with direct involvement in development of programming, training, and supervision of personnel and students in implementing programming elements and facilitating engagement, participation, and training of community partners. Dr. Sweezy has roots in parent training and interest and extensive experience with staff training and community-based behavioral assessment and interventions applied to individuals across the lifespan with ASD slash DD, dual and complex diagnoses, and severe and complex behaviors. Dr. Sweezy has further served as principal investigator or PI or director on numerous studies over the past 24 years. She has an extensive history of exceptional grantee and organizational leadership with effective execution of local, state, and national project aims and objectives. We also have with us today Dr. Tiffany Neal. Dr. Neal has a rich background in clinical neuropsychology, school psychology, and applied behavior analysis with a concentration in complex or dual diagnoses. She has experience across inpatient, outpatient, diagnostic, homeschool, and community-based service and treatment settings. In addition to service and training roles, she has been active in teaching and serving as an invited member or representative among local, state, and national associations, task forces, and committees focused on autism, dual diagnoses, policies and funding, diversity and equity, implementation science, and program evaluation. Dr. Neal's experience has greatly informed her approach towards and focus on mental and behavioral health care and training. Among various roles as the Assistant Director at the Hands and Autism Center, Dr. Neal lends oversight to the approach, curriculum, partnerships, research, and dissemination efforts for the Center. Slides and handouts can be found in the handout section in the panel down your right-hand side of your screen. Please stay for our Q&A at the end of this presentation with Dr. Sweezy and Dr. Neal. And now I turn it over to you, Dr. Neal. Thanks, Kristen. Okay. So building off what Kristen had shared, uh, we will be using Poll Everywhere today to make sure you're able to engage throughout um, and also to lend some insight to where your perspectives are coming from and really what experiences you're building off of um, as you represent those perspectives. Um, we also encourage you to post takeaways or aha moments or pictures as you're going along. Um, this is another way to engage and we've included the at hands ha um, tag down there at the bottom, um, but also have included Dr. Susie and my own um, so that you can also tag us and we'll be happy to share or connect through that platform as well. We also encourage you to sign up for newsletters uh, through our center um, to keep engaged and to really uh, continue the conversation, which will prompt further as we go along. To start off, uh, as I mentioned with Poll Everywhere, we have a few different ways you can use that and we really appreciate the engagement. Uh, we suggest that you pick one of those methods and then keep it handy throughout the session because we're gonna prompt a few questions on Poll Everywhere as we go along. You can either choose to use your phone and scan the QR code there uh, you can follow the link that's included here, a brief pollev.com uh, hyperlink, or you can text your response using your mobile device or phone uh, to hands and autism 698, or you text hands and autism 698 to 37607 to join the session. Um, and then again, we'll have about four or five different questions we'll pose 
and we hope you'll use that device to be able to respond. So we're starting first with describing your role. So think of five nouns. That could be teacher, that could be advocate, parent, provider, ally. Um, think about those uh, roles that you serve within the community and describe those here. Just as a reminder, you can text Hands and Autism 698 to 37607, or I can go back to that same screen. So you have it. As an assist to Dr. Neal, the links have also been chatted into the window and also placed on the networking cafe. Perfect, thank you. So we'll continue going forward, um, and Dr. Suzy, I'll, I'll go, or actually I'll go over, I believe, the objectives here. Uh, the objectives are found in your handout, um, and we'll hit on those um, as we go through. We'll be looking at the complications or regression uh, that can lead to sustained support needs for those with autism across the lifespan. We'll help you reflect upon that organizational capacity as we facilitate and implement evidence-based practices. And then we'll really focus on engaging on some of those case reviews as we near out, as we near the end or round out the communication, um, and really how different factors come into play in regards to communication, individual and organizational capacity, and accessibility, not only for the individuals, but also the provider, staff, and patient experiences. We want to look at the impacts of organizational climates and factors, and then explore and, and really build on the experiences that you all bring to the table to look at other agile strategy, strategies that can really enhance the capacity and also our service outcomes with the patients that we're serving. To accomplish that, we're gonna go through these core agenda items, uh, first hitting on autism as a critical care need, um, both with, across our state and nationally, uh, looking at community engaged frameworks and how those inform from the inside out, uh, exploring our coordinated care continuum, and then as I mentioned, going through some specific cases in regards to solution-focused impacts and strategies. Thanks for setting us up there, Tiffany. Appreciate that. Uh, so as Tiffany mentioned, we're going to start with autism services as a critical care need. So when we consider autism uh, and disability collectively uh, across the nation, we know that disability affects greater than 15% of the population and is the, the nation's largest minority group that really spans across all uh, types of uh, people with different races, ethnicities, socioeconomic status, uh, and so many more factors. Autism in particular has a prevalence rate of 1 in 44 uh, from the most recent data from uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and that puts us at just over 2% uh, of the population. And we know that uh, autism has comorbidity with many psychiatric or neurodevelopmental disorders, also has uh, frequent co-occurring medical problems, uh, and also that the support requirements for autism really increase across the lifespan. What will be important in our conversation today is to understand that although we have a focus on autism and developmental disabilities, um, certainly with this prevalence rate, uh, you all are going to be in contact with these folks. Uh, but even if that's not the greatest part of your population, we know that uh, the interventions and the assessments that are necessary and uh, uh, really essential for autism and developmental disabilities are really relevant to all types of uh, disorders. Next. 
Uh, so when we consider autism spectrum disorder and disabilities within our own state, you can look to the right and kind of find your area and see uh, how prevalent it is within that area. Uh, but we know that about 17% uh, of the population has developmental disabilities that have need for added intervention and support. That amounts to over 3 million people who are directly and indirectly, when we consider uh, the different caregivers and providers uh, who are impacted by developmental disabilities and autism. When we consider the factor of mental health as well, we know that up to 70% of youth with autism have co-occurring mental health conditions, which is compared to 25% of youth without autism. Many are meeting criteria for at least one, if not more, co-occurring mental health conditions, and the most frequent ones tend to be ADHD, disruptive behavior disorders, and anxiety. Uh, regardless of the mental health disorders or the co-occurring mental health conditions, uh, we know that really critical to success is that we have uh, effective, efficient, and appropriate assessment, stabilization, and treatment uh, across the different diagnoses and more specifically across the various symptoms uh, that we're treating uh, related to those various disorders. When we look at service, so uh, folks like you all who are providing services uh, within our state, uh, less than 20% are reporting having any disabilities training, and over 50% feel inadequately prepared to provide treatment to those with autism or developmental disabilities. That in combination with a lack of available crisis beds uh, to meet uh, the, the needs for stabilization, providers who are unwilling or unable to accept uh, those who have acute disorders or aggression uh, and also have autism and developmental disabilities, and uh, a lack, to, lack of front-end diagnoses and assessment services that can effectively inform uh, placement decisions. All of that leads to really an inability uh, to meet the needs of youth with autism and developmental disabilities uh, in general, but definitely within the community as well. What we also find with, uh, with service is a great deal of cost. Uh, and uh, so when we think about that, we think about the 126 uh, billion dollars per year that's spent nationally uh, for autism and developmental disabilities care. Uh, that equates to, per individual, about $2.3 million across the lifespan. Uh, but considering that is uh, impact enough, but then when we consider the fact that most of these dollars are really tied to uh, providing residential care or having repeated emergency or hospital admissions, which ultimately don't uh, really impact or impact positively, uh, and they definitely don't improve long-term functioning of individuals. So a great deal of cost is going uh, to uh, factors and uh, uh, interventions that really are, in the end, are not effective. What we also need to consider within service and care is uh, the culture. And so when we talk about culture, we're talking about a learned and shared knowledge uh, that specific groups are using to really generate their behavior and interpret all their experiences that they face within the world. Um, and this can apply to so many different groups. Uh, all different kinds of groups have their own culture. So when we think about race or ethnicity, religion, po uh, policy, professional groups, uh, other groups, really de determining uh, their socioeconomic status as well as where they're located within the state or within the nation. Um, all of those types of considerations impact what cultures they might be a part of. Uh, and those cultures then transmit uh, their ideas and their perspectives uh, through various social and institutional traditions and norms uh, that do pass across the generations. And many aspects uh, of those cultures do remain consistent, uh, but it also can be very dynamic and changing over time. So when we consider those cultures on disability, we think about uh, two contexts uh, overall. So we think about the outer context, which really uh, is talking about the various systems, larger global systems 
uh, that are impacting everybody, no matter what culture they're a part of. Uh, so the healthcare system, the education system, uh, every system that we take part of, of uh, within our communities. But then there's also an inner context and an inner culture that impacts uh, our views and our perceptions on disability and so much else. Uh, and that inner context has to do with the individual, their family, and their particular team that they're engaged with within their local area. Overall, with service needs, uh, what's important considering all of these factors is that it's essential that we have uh, assessment. Uh, assessment we know has to be uh, the initial assessment to identify the appropriate placement and intervention, uh, but also there has to be ongoing assessment to make sure that we're making progress. So whatever we're putting into place, uh, we know that we're having an impact uh, with our service and with our care. We also, uh, as part of service, need to make sure that we're providing for stabilization. So when we talk about uh, folks who are going into the hospital or to the ER, uh, or just in general with medication management or any other uh, type of intervention, we are looking for stabilization. And that could be medical stabilization, behavioral stabilization, or otherwise. But ultimately, uh, to generalize that care and to make sure it's very practical and relevant to the individuals and their team members uh, is to make sure that we're having not only coordinated care amongst all of those different folks, uh, but also that we are integrating that care. And so we're really complementing one another with our various strengths and weaknesses to make sure that we're coming up with a consistency in implementation uh, and implementation that is informed by the community, is culturally responsive, and ultimately adapts and helps to stabilize uh, the individual within the context of their community. So we have a little exercise here uh, just to understand a bit about where your perspective falls. Uh, and I'll have Tiffany explain that a little bit more. So when we think about perspectives, uh, we think about positive and negative thoughts. And we know that negative thoughts are sometimes necessary and evolutionary. So it, survives a, it provides a survival tactic. Um, so thinking something negative is going to happen or thinking um, you know, again, you don't want to get caught in a negative situation. Those carry so much more gravity and so much more weight in your mind. Whereas positive thoughts are much lighter um, and you need multiple of those to really trump all of the negative thoughts or negative emotions. Um, so we want to see in terms of your perspective towards uh, working with individuals on the spectrum or experiences with individuals on the spectrum, where your perspective falls. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how that's been informed. So we'll try this again. Um, if you can respond to pollev.com uh, backslash hands and autism 698 or text um, hands and autism 698 to 37607. There you go. Great. So it seems like we have a lot that are kind of in that neutral category. So either not having a lot of experience or maybe having a combination of both positive and negative feelings and experiences, um, or maybe even unsure um, where you've had some um, you know, more negative than positive. Okay. So as you consider that, Phil had, if you haven't yet responded, go ahead. Um, but for those of you that have already responded, uh, we want you to think about, about kind of what's informing your perspective or how has it been influenced. Um, there's three ways that our perspectives that are influenced. Uh, it's either through subjective experiences, positive or negative, whether that was through training, impressions, uh, implicit biases. Um, maybe a story that was shared, but not a direct interaction. So it's more of just a subjective feeling in terms of positive or negative. 
Think about your individual. It could also be informed by direct interactions with autistic individuals. Um, and then the third piece that influences our perspectives is our organizational culture or capacity. Um, so those systemic pieces, um, wh whether it's not serving those individuals or a positive perspective towards individuals on the spectrum. Um, but each of those three play a huge role in your perspectives. So as you think about your perspectives, um, think about how it's been influenced. So stepping back a little bit, because we're going to go into a section where we talk a little bit about organizational factors and, and inner factors, as well as experiences and readiness. So think about whether it's been those subjective, those individual interactions, organizational culture, or some combination of those with the others. So it looks like we definitely have a combination. A good proportion have had some direct interaction and we know that direct interaction um, is oftentimes what really guides and helps us in terms of our experiences. Um, but there's definitely a combination across there with that subjective component and some organizational factors. So continue reflecting on that. And we're gonna go ahead and go into some of the dialogue about how those different factors interplay with one another. As we look at community engaged frameworks and really how to better equip and service the need that Dr. Susie was just covering, um, we think about that from, again, that broader organizational perspective that sometimes we lose sight of when we're thinking about individual direct care. Overall, we know it takes a community um, and it takes an informed community um, to really deliver effective and coordinated care. Um, that coordinated care and process has to involve evidence-based practices um, with with uh, the case of both mental health and autism, we have great resources to go to to find out about evidence-based practices, but it's very important to use practices that are informed by the literature, informed by research, and that we're also working in service or decision-making coalitions and networks. Um, too often, there's a tendency to kind of operate in silos and not really work together, um, which is, again, where that coordinated care comes into play. The accessibility or really the diversity that comprises those networks is essential to look at ongoing. A lot of times we see there's some limitations in, in the diversity um, and who is sitting at the table. Um, so those uh, limitations are coming in when we don't have diversity, um, when we only are meeting and connecting with um, those that are less diverse and are, are primarily white backgrounds or um, more narrow in scope backgrounds. We can't see all of the lenses of the community without more representation. That thus um, makes our effectiveness of interventions more limited. Um, we can't consider all of the different avenues, which is again why we really want to engage you all today um, as we think about kind of different components related to the intervention. Is it acceptable within your community? So thinking about cultural norms and what we're training or what we're really thinking about in terms of skills teaching or response. Is it a usable intervention? Um, can you use that across settings and do you understand it at a level that it's actually of utility to you? Um, so is it addressing the behavioral challenge or the need that you have within that community? Is it feasible? Um, perhaps you have four or five patients or a family has you know, multiple kids with disabilities. The feasibility of the intervention and the way that we've adapted it, particular to that setting that still maintains the properties of the practice, is really important to really getting the buy-in and the sustainability. And that last piece is fidelity. Um, so really thinking about the readiness and the sustainability of the implementation within that context. But we can only think through that if we have all of the different people at the table to discuss that and to share openly. As we think about readiness and really changing the climate, um, again, this comes back to that community piece, but this is a bit more of an inner context uh, component as Dr. Susie was talking about. When we think about readiness, we can cluster that into three pieces. Um, as you're working with a family or as you're working with a new team, you think about the general capacity of the team. 
Um, are they kind of able to carry on general conversations? Can they really initiate and brainstorm and sustain change? Um, so some examples might be flexible, flexibility in thinking about what a team member's role could include. Um, who could work on that? Who could work in that setting? Who could double up and really allow more practice in working through a behavior? Um, how willing are people to even engage in the training and coaching process? The next category is really looking at the innovation specific capacities. Um, so you think about that particular intervention. Um, so when we're talking about it in this context, we're thinking about behavioral interventions. Um, other contexts, we might be talking about workforce development or job exploration. But whatever that intervention is, we're looking about uh, looking at what all the conditions are, what all the necessary parts are uh, to deliver that with fidelity, but also to hold through consistently. consistently. Um, some examples here might be if we're putting in a strategy and we don't see it works um, or we're not seeing that it works with this setting, but it works in this setting, then we need to have, some, have a refreshed attitude and kind of learn a new approach or try it again if maybe it failed once before. Um, again, we have to be thinking in this context and for this population um, about those extinction bursts and that the fact that this is, these are learned behaviors um, we have to be ready for those behaviors to spike or to get worse at different points in time when setting events or triggers are in place. And we may get to the point of crisis or using a crisis plan or family support plan, but we have to be ready for that and have to have an effective teaming capacity. Um, again, the third piece is um, as a part of that readiness component is motivation. Um, so our, we have to have willing partners involved um, and a desire to really see improved outcomes for the individuals. Uh, that's where that discussion of perspective comes into play, that we have to kind of work through potentially biases or limitations um, to really ensure that there's motivation and that we're all working towards a common goal or a common outcome. So having that interest in working through, holding each other accountable, supporting us where we're at, um, and really building and engaging as a team. Similarly, so thinking about the community and the readiness, um, we have to also think about the moderators or what we call facilitators or barriers in that process. Um, so we think about strategies uh, that we have to have in place that are kind of workarounds to those barriers. So thinking about travel or resource access or um, things that have been, you know, what were perceived as barriers in the past. And then facilitators are things that will help us advance towards successful implementation. Other examples might include service access and diversity. Uh, so like Dr. Susie was mentioning, we have a shortage of providers. Um, so we have to think outside of the box in terms of service ways to access service or what, what we can use waiver funding for or what hours we most need to use those for. Um, what, how can we equip people with knowledge and resources and when is that most essential so that just-in-time learning and just-in-time coaching. Um, we also have to, and this kind of complements that readiness piece, make sure people feel safe and supported. Um, so always thinking about that as a motivator, that if they feel safe, they feel informed, and they feel supported in the process and have a go-to, that's also going to be a big factor. Um, letting people know about rights and regulations um, and really equipping them again with the knowledge are both moderators within there. Um, and those last years are really thinking about kind of that collaboration overall. So coming in with the expectation that we have to work together. Um, there can't be anyone that's working alone in this when we're working with individuals that have very complex needs. Um, so really assessing and kind of checking in and monitoring this ongoing uh, to make sure that we're all working on the same page um, and that we're sharing common communications and working towards common outcomes. Um, and lastly, we have to remember that change is not quick. Um, so systems change takes three or more years, um, sometimes longer. Uh, these are all learned behaviors. And so a big piece as a facilitator um, is that recognition um, and an understanding and reminder of what progress we've made, um, what the data is showing us and how we can continue to work through that um, and considering and appreciating other demands. As we think about improving those outcomes, um, we also have to have effective leadership. I think we all have been in those seats where you see there's a great, great teacher or a great provider, or there's that one great person, and if they leave, everything seems to be abandoned and falling apart. Um, that real sustainability requires strong leadership. Um, so again, having that oversight body or having someone that's able to kind of you know, facilitate overall 
um, as we mentioned earlier in terms of key components, uh, there are some noted there that really take um, a very key role in terms of moving from initially installing or thinking about intervention all the way through to fully implementing and sustaining that program. Um, so thinking about use of those evidence-based principles, really being proactive, having that facilitated team, and having that systems level approach. So thinking about each of those and having that strong champion or organizational body. The last piece is thinking about that inner context. Um, so we talk a lot about that outer context and supporting the team and, and readiness and keeping motivated, but really looking at that more neutral or kind of core section. Um, so integrating rather than operating within each of those isolated cultures or bubbles um, so that we have that integration and continuity within the natural setting. Um, we really want to make sure the relevancy and the feasibility of each of the interventions is spanning not only for that person, uh, but making the connections for other providers, making the connections across settings and materials, and really using those across the different systems that you're working in. Again, that's where the importance of a robust and ongoing support network comes into play, uh, where we're able to provide that family and provider training, um, that there's that ongoing monitoring and data accessible, and that we can really facilitate uh, more of a systems level approach and understanding and thinking outside of the box. Um, overall, that integration is key. We've all got different experiences we bring to the table and it helps us isolate and kind of identify gaps and who could help accomplish that or who could fill that or what is another solution. Um, so we can really support one another as we're working on fidelity of implementation or uh, implementing these with strength. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a background on uh, basically an intervention and a, a program that we've been able to evolve uh, quite recently in collaboration with DMHA uh, and our partners at the NDI. Uh, I, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about HANDS and how it fits into uh, that larger context. Uh, so to start with HANDS, uh, HANDS is really developed uh, as an entity to uh, help us to derive some trainings that are uh, very interactive in nature, allow folks to do some problem solving, be very um, engaged in training, uh, to learn evidence-based practices that they're able to practice, uh, get feedback, coaching, mentoring, uh, and through that kind of very active process are able to better integrate uh, the type of training experiences that they have. So we know of a lot of different opportunities where folks are able to kind of passively listen and learn through that modality, but we know that true training uh, and changing our practice really comes from uh, a much more interactive style of training, and that's something that we provide at Hands and Autism. Uh, what we also do uh, and really focus on is that bridging across systems. So you've talked, you've heard us talking already about uh, the various systems and networks and collaborations that need to be a part of uh, the treatment services to be most effective and most sustainable. Uh, and so we're interfacing and working across all of those different large systems, including with families and medical and first responders and uh, uh, schools and so on and so forth uh, to really help them to collaborate effectively. Ultimately, our goal is to build local capacity uh, in folks understanding and use, uh, again, that practical use and implementation with fidelity of uh, evidence-based practices. Uh, so not just learning about them, but really utilizing them to the point where uh, they're able to make real change within their own local uh, areas. And that folks within those local communities are able to uh, really have the tools, information, and resources necessary uh, to take the shared responsibility that's also necessary in providing for sustainable outcomes for individuals and families. <laughs> Very essential to our process has been uh, developing uh, a really a, a constellation of various entities. Uh, we have developed a framework, we've developed a framework 
And we've also developed a process in which folks are able to learn, again, more effectively about the, the essential components uh, that are necessary in intervention with uh, individuals with autism and developmental disabilities. Uh, we customize the trainings and uh, the resources and the information to all types of uh, people really meeting them where they're at within their role, within their setting, uh, so that it can be most feasible uh, and usable. Uh, and provide all kinds of resource options. And so depending on the type of format in which folks learn most effectively, uh, whether they need handouts or CDs or uh, live trainings or webinars, uh, we are providing uh, various materials and activities to uh, follow along with those. We also have a very large uh, engagement network. So what we've worked very hard to do over time and bridging all the entities and uh, being able to provide uh, training and facilitation uh, is to really lead uh, as a facilitator in systems change uh, through implementation science uh, and through that implementation process of uh, really exploring what the needs are within the communities, the varying communities, the varying roles, the various settings, uh, and really helping folks with uh, literature-based and research-based uh, uh, information, uh, as well as really making sure that we're keeping the eye on what is uh, essential practice uh, and necessary practice to ensure that uh, we are providing the very best service uh, and with fidelity to our consumers. Uh, and we do that by facilitating various entities within the community and within the state, uh, various stakeholders across uh, various areas of the state, as well as the uh, leaders uh, of various state en entities with the really the end goal of making sure that there is impact, uh, whether it be with policy, whether it be with uh, changes in practice, with the training, uh, within various communities, within various regions, within agencies, and to the individual providers, and ultimately to impact uh, the families and the individuals with autism. So all of that is to say that that leads to the groundwork uh, in many years, uh, 18 years of hands in autism, uh, to be able to uh, really be able to uh, compile all of those different components uh, and be able to serve uh, the NDI, which is a treatment uh, center uh, that is located within Indianapolis. Uh, we are collaborating with Damar Services and with the rest of uh, the Department of Psychiatry uh, to really run an adolescent autism unit, uh, but really to provide comprehensive and coordinated services that allow for individuals with very complex needs uh, that also have autism and are uh, 12 to 18 years of age uh, to get an acute stay in which they are staying at the unit for about six weeks and of duration in which they are able to get some medical stabilization, uh, get some uh, initial assessment, initial treatment ideas, and then ultimately our greatest focus with hands and autism is to follow the individuals for a year post-discharge within their own communities in which we're facilitating uh, the teams and also training the various team members to allow for some of that uh, collaboration, coordination, integration, and ultimate success of these individuals. So our, our focus is uh, that we are oftentimes and, and most definitely training in evidence-based practices uh, across folks in different settings and different roles. And we know that evidence-based practices in and of themselves can improve outcomes for individuals with autism uh, and development disabilities. But as we've been talking about, it's also essential that those strategies be uh, implemented with fidelity, uh, that folks be well-trained, and that we really address uh, the barriers as well as uh, improve upon the facilitators uh, that are really going to help with implementation within the communities uh, and ultimately with success to ensure that consumers are benefiting from the intervention. 
our patient demographics. Uh, over time, we've uh, served uh, almost uh, 50, a little over 50 uh, individuals at this point. Uh, again, you can find your region on these maps. Uh, just to indicate where we've had uh, more frequent uh, flyers, if you will, uh, within our state. But then also you can see represented to the side uh, where those folks are coming from more urban regions. Uh, the later colors are the, the uh, higher economic status. Uh, and then you can also see where uh, we have more resource rich areas. Uh, and some of those are in the urban regions, uh, but in some cases we are finding some uh, very healthy resource rich areas in some of the smaller communities and rural communities as well. Um, but it definitely differs. You can see the size of those yellow dots. Uh, again, the larger ones indicate larger sizes of teams and more resources. Overall, we've had 71 referrals since uh, February of 2021. There was a little bit of a delay with COVID in kind of uh, kickstarting uh, these interventions and the NDI process. Uh, but since then, 71 referrals with 51 patients accepted uh, and 71% of those are male. Uh, very common uh, target problems that you would uh, imagine is uh, the physical aggression, the destruction, self-injurious behaviors, verbal aggression and elopement or running away. Uh, and over to the right, you can see uh, a reflection of some of the data that we're collecting. Um, some of the data is on uh, the clinical global impression scale. Uh, ultimately, that clinical global impressions is to look at severity, but also improvement over time. And when we just look at severity, we can see that uh, those individuals are averaging 6.04. And at the level of six, those are folks who typically are appropriate for inpatient hospitalization. And then uh, on average in long-term follow-up up through that year, uh, follow-up, we're averaging more like 1.7, uh, which is a huge uh, and extensive amount of uh, improvement. So as you think about that data and really tying it back to what we were discussing earlier in terms of the impacts of culture and organization and individual readiness and, and various factors that come into play with individual patient success, um, we wanted to engage you all um, as a coalition or group work group um, in talking through a few cases and looking at other strategies that you might consider or think of um, when you're applying some of those earlier concepts. So the first example um, is a 15 year old patient. Uh, so it, as with a lot of state hospitals, their primary diagnosis cannot be autism. Um, they have the co-occurring uh, disruptive behavior disorder as a primary diagnosis. Um, so intermittent explosive disorder, autism, ADHD, and asthma. Um, so again, that constellation of behaviors or diagnoses um, doesn't matter as much as the symptoms, the history, and that treatment forward, um, but it's important in terms of stabilization. This patient had a history of meltdowns that began in fourth grade. Um, so thinking about, about, about a five to six um, year path um, of, of lots of behaviors that have required multiple school placements, um, several provider changes, um, and really with those greatest impacts coming in the home setting um, where the family really had very limited resources um, and had resulted in injury to both caregivers and need for first responders to be called more than 170 times in the two years prior to admission. Within that particular case, um, and again, tying back to what we were talking about, the need to really look at the context of each individual setting. Um, so not just looking at the behaviors and not just looking at the individual patient, but really considering all of the factors that are coming into play, um, you look at the inner context. And when we're thinking about that integrated care piece, you think about um, the parental figures or the caregivers in the home. Um, both have health challenges and other components, including past trauma or past negative experiences as they've engaged with first responders. Um, they also have limited social support. Um, so not a very big extended family or extended network, um, really just limited to one other primary family member. When we think about the outer context, um, they've had limited success in that coordinated care piece or all of those organizational factors. Um, a lot of times when they're able to engage support providers or persons coming in, um, they're kind of just hanging out with the patient or hanging out with that particular person. 
um, especially during those good times. Um, so that honeymoon as he's coming off the unit, um, when he really needed to step it up, explain the expectations and really be putting in place um, these new supports and expectations. So where the roles come into play. The school is also very limited um, in their first initial engagement. So knowing that we all need to be working from the same page, all looking at those outcomes and really starting strong at the beginning, um, but there was some limited engagement. Um, and from the first responder community perspective, again, um, everybody working in silos is not an effective uh, teaming setting or a chance for teaming. Um, and there was a lot of just emotions involved. Um, seeing their role is very narrow um, and that their use or their engagement in those particular settings um, were really more imposing on their time and really causing more safety concerns among the community. When we look at other factors, um, as we were discussing about uh, readiness, um, really looking at kind of those three core components that have to change or have to be impacted or intervened on concurrent to putting new behavioral changes or interventions in place. In terms of general capacity, um, there was at discharge and kind of building over time and post-discharge, a large team. Um, so everything from psychology and um, you know others that were doing evaluation to the school to mental health or wraparound providers, um, and then also the family and, and that limited network. Um, and they really needed to have more shared responsibility in looking at the perspectives. Um, all of them were definitely um, kind of impacting one another and sometimes competing um, against one another within those settings. So looking at how we can accomplish um, more improved capacity. Um, much by way of um, kind of cycling or shuffling between systems and providers still. Um, so definitely a source of potential intervention. Um, and then like I mentioned that siloed work, all of those kind of falling within just their general capacity to hold it together, to really adopt new strategies and to look towards a different system change. In terms of innovation specific capacities, so both adherence to the medical recommendations and also um, fidelity of implementing the behavioral interventions, um, it was identifying again kind of those proactive pieces that needed to be in place and across systems, across providers, across settings, um, and understanding that that emergency and crisis response was not addressing the root issues or looking at the real function of those behaviors. Um, also further recognition that the placement or those more intensive um, you know, engagements with residential or emergency services were not going to result in long-term resolution or long-term improvement. However, on that motivation piece, um, the family was really um, advocating and an asset within the uh, kind of overall advocacy piece. So as they became more educated um, and could provide more of a backbone to those services and knew what their rights were, um, motivation continued to increase um, and really looking at that as a core piece within the integrated care. Really looking to alter and share the data in terms of long-term behavior pa patterns. And even though we saw ups and downs in the behavior and data, um, that overall the trends were going in the right direction um, and really encourage that to use um, in following recommendations and equipping the family and team uh, to better advocate and use resources that were accessible. So for this particular case, uh, just helping you see some of the moderators and then also the readiness factors as we go into a couple of other cases and consider kind of trajectories and how those come into play. For the data, you can see that for this particular patient um, who had that you know, five, or five plus years of, of really aggressive and, and destructive behavior, um, that over time uh, with those different factors coming into play, we do see re behavior reduction. So you see some ups and downs, but overall that trend line's going down. Um, you also see on the goal attainment scaling, um, so that second chart, uh, that we do see improvement in behavior reduction. Um, so behaviors are going down, um, and that that parent and caregiver fidelity and buy-in is going up. For overall functioning, we also see that there's improvement in overall functioning, um, looking in the self-care, and then looking in other areas as those pulled up over time. What we want to do is use that in this last uh, chunk of time to really uh, do some brainstorming or allow you guys to work. Um, we have included a, a link to a jam board. Um, if you're able to access Google, I know some people are limited. Um, so if you can't do it on your computer, you can consider using it on your phone. And we've included, included both a tiny URL there to go to, um, to pull up the jam board and then also a QR code to pull that up. When you get there, uh, you'll see that there are five slides or five boards 
um, and they have this trajectory here. Um, it may look familiar in that it's from the life course framework, um, and we do use this as part of our goal setting process with each of the families and teams. Um, again, to make sure that we're all working towards the same outcome. Um, we're working towards what the family wants to work towards, and that may not be what we want, or we may set our bar higher, but then kind of building the motivation or looking at that are important. Um, as we go through each case and individual trajectory, uh, specific to movement towards those positive outcomes, and preventing or not making sure we're not going down that other road towards negative events, we want you to make notes on there. Um, as I'm talking through the cases, I want you to consider uh, different alternatives or things that come to mind for you as a provider from your respective lens or perspective um, that may have impacted their readiness. Um, so as we share key events, um, think about things that could have supplemented or um, helped in general capacity or in motivation. Um, think about you know, the inner context, so something within that internal network, some of the individual family or individual factors. Um, think about the outer context. Was there another group that could have been getting engaged, um, especially as we talk about the latter case that went a little bit more towards that negative event um, or a trajectory that we weren't hoping for? Um, as I'm going through the cases, um, hopefully you've got the Jamboard pulled up at this point, um, and you'll see there's a key on the slide so that if you have that as your screen as we're talking through or on your phone, um, it has the cues in terms of how you can complete those, and we've put samples on each of the slides to help as well. So for this case, rather than presenting you know, the moderators in readiness, um, we're going to share a little about the case and then kind of the trajectory that that case was following. For this one, this is a 15-year-old, again, um, who had a similar constellation of behaviors. Um, he was one, however, that his autism diagnosis was removed while on the unit as part of differential diagnosis. However, uh, one of the presenting challenges in a setting that he had a lot of challenges in within the school um, was a, a key piece um, where they were able to do some comprehensive academic achievement testing um, and able to diagnose him with a reading disorder or dyslexia. Um, that was then able to be accommodated within his IEP and is a critical event as we go through his trajectory. Prior to that, he had not been able to complete any formal or standardized testing since early elementary, so the school had no idea where his academic levels were, given the behaviors that were occurring both in home and school settings. He had decreased his services uh, within the school um, to less than one hour of homebound, and he was going in only for a couple of reinforcing activities a day. Uh, the family was regularly picking him up, even in that, and at the point of discharge, even, they were still looking for residential options, um, given the high rates of, of property destruction, noncompliance, physical aggression, and elopement, um, where he was bolting out of the building, he was getting out of cars, and he was eloping across settings. Um, in terms of the, uh, the his other context factors, so those outer factors, there was a lack of providers, um, and his increasing size, he's a big boy, um, and, in, and differences in behavioral programming were really in, um, leading to some uh, resistance towards the behavioral change. He also had a tendency to kind of exaggerate stories or make things up, um, which definitely came into play in terms of people's perceptions or attitudes about his care and his services. So as you see, we use that trajectory um, to highlight some of the growth that he's accomplished in this last year, or the team and the family have been able to accomplish. Um, so as you're looking at your Jamboard, uh, we want you to think about some of those factors or other things that you think may have helped um, as we play it planned out um, what the family's goals were. Some of the goals included him engaging in full day programming. So if that's a full day at school, that would be great. Maybe it's a combination of uh, working with a mentor and going to school for part of that day, but really accruing credits and working towards his high school diploma. They also really wanted to and placed a lot of emphasis on family engagement, um, wanting some consistency with that. Um, they wanted to avoid, conversely, um, a reliance on those more restrictive placements. Uh, so looking towards residential, and that's where they felt they were headed. So some of the uh, pathways or some of the activities that occurred um, that really set stage uh, for where he's at now, a year out of his discharge from NDI, included added structure and limiting his media access. Um, so identifying some parental controls and things of that nature. Other steps included updates to his IEP to reflect his reading disability diagnosis, and then working with the school team and the parents on what accommodations were appropriate or what they should expect within that setting. 
incorporating mentors and other community programming elements. Um, so looking at library events and ways to structure a full day for him. Um, other components also included identifying and coordinating care across setting and team members. Um, there was a lot of challenge with his continued medical care as well as others uh, where providers were leaving and such. Um, so really helping equip the family with other tools and resources as well as knowing what their rights were within those settings. And that last step, um, as we were charting out kind of what it would take to get to that full day or, or get to those positive outcomes, included things like uh, the parent fidelity and collaboration and working together towards that. So thinking about each of those, um, what you see is most important as motivators, um, as you know, potential outer and inner context, and noting some of those things that you would think as a provider to put in there. Another key arm, um, as we're looking at this case, was the work that the family put in to make sure they did not head towards that negative event. Um, and again, that, that, what, that did come up very early on. Um, they had several providers that either left their practice or retired. Um, they had a lot of connections um, in trying to access justice where they saw that that was not an avenue they wanted to take. Um, they really needed to step it up in the home and not rely on that avenue. And then they also still had taken an eye at, uh, or a look at residential placements, but once we had established a list of questions to ask and they started actually calling, they realized that that was not, as we were suggesting, a long-term solution, and they also needed to really work on that parent fidelity. So looking at your Jamboard and just making notes on, on key things that you would think of as a provider that would help facilitate that um, for this real case scenario. This case where we saw the behaviors continue to go down um, and they've continued to go down past that point um, where we've seen his goals continue to rise and he's mastered those and moved on to new goals and also where his overall functioning is, has improved as we've worked towards that long-term outcome. The third case, and I know we're rounding out on time, um, but we want you to think as you're looking at that Jamboard and just putting things into place um, this is a case that it did head more towards that negative direction, and we want to share some just key factors that came into play and help you or encourage you to think about, you know, factors that may have uh, changed that organizationally or at an inner context or readiness level. This is a 13-year-old patient who had um, a combination of diagnoses. He also had his autism diagnosis removed while on the unit uh, through differential diagnosis, um, but it still carried it as a special education eligibility. He also had a history of leukemia at three years of age and went through the necessary medical course of treatment for that. Um, and then a lot of providers continued to attribute that medical event um, to his long-term uh, behavioral challenges. Other increases in behavior over time were documented uh, due to those medication changes. Again, personal upheavals and moving um, as the family had moved between states and the concern that other trauma may have occurred across those moves. The differences in setting implementation um, also were a big factor, um, both in terms of behavioral implementation uh, between school, home, and community providers, and then also potential sources or, or causes for some of his um, kind of different behavioral topography. Um, so he had a lot of uh, bathroom or rectal uh, behavior uh, that were averse to uh, some of the team members. Um, and that led to some initial uh, or resistance to some of the behavioral changes um, that then you know, arose more and more. As we look at his trajectory, uh, then we look at the same thing. Uh, so family had set some goals in terms of really wanting him to better engage within the school, community, and home setting, and then having both positive family and peer interactions. So just being able to play with the neighbor, or just being able to go outside and play. Um, cause that was oftentimes a time where, you know, he's stealing items or getting into trouble. Um, and they similarly initially wanted to really, uh, reduce the reliance on more restrictive placement. So as we were going across and looking at his trajectory, um, essential pieces were adding structure across settings and getting into, uh, kind of what that generalization to home looked like, making sure all parties were consistent in response to those target behaviors. So the fecal play, uh, the property destruction, risk, risky behavior, and aggression. Um, so really testing the limits and making sure everybody was responding similarly. Uh, coordinating across the team through added visits and coaching to work through that extinction burst. 
and increasing those team members so that everybody was clear. Um, and there was added services that were put in place to really help uh, in terms of extended respite and allowing some added self-care both for the family and then also with a younger sibling in the home. Additional coaching and training were put in place to help continue to coordinate and integrate the care and in helping to try to get to that positive outcome. So these pieces are what we were really hoping to work towards a positive outcome. However, in this situation, we saw that the shift really took a negative turn um, along the pathway. Um, as the family shared with the medical team about events and behavior change, um, and that it wasn't swift enough. Uh, so again, being able to have the stamina and fidelity over time. Um, medical recommendations were made to call 911, document all incidents, and then keep that documentation, not to access more services per se, but really to look at residential care. Um, and then again, there was a lot of validation and attention and thus increased motivation to go down this avenue um, by the medical team. And uh, again, a lot of reinforcement of the permanency of neurological impacts. So a pretty inflexible perspective in terms of neurology and that, that neuropsych behind it. So again, that's a situation where we saw um, some great growth at first in terms of parent fidelity, as you can see. Um, so again, saw some, some lowered behaviors initially after discharge. Um, and then we saw those behaviors kind of increase and have some vacillation or decrease, um, but overall rose to pre-admission levels over time um, as we shifted and went down a different path. Similar to the goals, um, we saw some goal improvement, uh, especially with parent fidelity over time, um, but that behavior reduction was a big factor. And overall, we saw his overall functioning um, while still improving, not getting to the point it could have um, had we had stayed on that positive trajectory. So as you look at your Jamboards, um, hopefully you've had a chance to put in some notes on that. Um, and then you also see there's a few slides at the end of the Jamboard that we want you to think through those cases or just applying some of those principles um, where you may have changed some of your perceptions, um, where you might think of new connections to your knowledge or experiences. And there's some prompts all across three different Jamboards that we would love if you put some post-its in there. Um, just on thinking about where you saw your attitude change or, you know, a flag that was raised or a perception that was changed. Um, maybe what you became aware of in terms of factors that you hadn't considered within provider care or within organizational context. Um, surprises, whether they were in the cases or things that you hadn't thought to consider within your practice. And then other just relation or um, kind of things that are your takeaways. Um, so rather than using a word cloud or anything, just dropping a post-it if you've been able to open that Jamboard. And I'm certain your facilitators have probably put that in your um, networking cafe to also respond there. Um, or maybe they can do that so you can continue your processing. We'd love to continue the conversation. Um, I know that we took up your Q&A time with sharing those cases, um, but we hope that gave you some good food for thought. Um, and if you'd like to continue the conversation, our intent is to really focus on that community engagement piece. Um, and we've included the uh, QR code here. It's the same poll everywhere. If you've already got that active on your computer, or on your phone, um, where you can just drop in your email and then we'll be able to follow up with you um, to continue the conversation or to share more with you individually or as part of your organization or group. Thank you. Dr. Neal, Dr. Sweezy, thank you so much. Um, so much phenomenal, actionable information, great case studies, great visualization of how we can better support uh, our patients. As we look at the uh, additional collaboration tools, we'll go ahead and post those on our networking cafe so that our participants can continue and stay engaged. Uh, and your slides as well are posted in PDF form. Uh, we do have several questions, but in the context of the time, I'm going to offer that for those that have a very hard 4.30 Eastern stop, um, please um, be feel comfortable to sign off. And thank you so much for your engagement and participation today. Uh, for those that have a few minutes, I just want to take maybe, let's say 12 minutes, and we'll close this out here at 4.45 with the questions and honor those participants that have questions. So in the context here, um, thank you so much in providing excellent case studies. When we are looking at the opportunity in working with families um, and their, their um, support of patients, what are some recommendations that you could provide 
or when caregivers or other family members are present within the appointment. I didn't catch that last part. I apologize. What was the last? Yes, when, when family members or caregivers are present in the appointment. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, Dr. Neal, I believe you're still on mute. I was, sorry. Um, so prior to appointments, if you have families or individuals within the visits, um, we oftentimes will prepare like a social narrative uh, that explains some of the information about the visit. If it's a first visit, we might even encourage them to visit the setting or um, connect with you in advance, or if you can send materials in advance, um, that makes both you more comfortable as well as the family and the team. Um, and then even a simple mini schedule, whether you've just written that out or you have one prepared for your practice, um, helps structure how much time you know, different pieces take, um, as well as kind of when we're going to be done. If it's undefined um, for the family as well as the patient, um, that mini schedule or sequence of events are great tools. Um, and hopefully it gives you a chance to build in reinforcers within there so that if they're, if you're, you know, coordinating care, asking questions of the family, um, that could be a choice time for the kid or individual um, where they can engage in something reinforcing to occupy their time and allow the parent to focus. Um, and then you're also allowed, and then you're also able to kind of reinforce and, and observe the child or individual during that time. Um, and you're able to model some of those uh, during that visit. We do have a, a lot of opportunities uh, for some of the types of interventions and the tools that might be needed, uh, some examples uh, on our website. We also um, provide a lot of tips and uh, uh, connections to our different tools that are related to those tips and emails. Uh, we have uh, uh, opportunities for office hours where you can answer questions, we can ask, answer questions that you might ask. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities uh, should you have questions related to specifics like that. Those are wonderful tactical examples and very specific items that we can share um, certainly as uh, really a reference and expectation within these appointments. Thank you so much. Um, one of the additional questions that were were very specific to case one regarding the interactions of uh, first responders, what type of trainings do you provide for first responders in being able to better understand uh, really the causes of, um, in, in some cases, right, more uh, aggressive behavior just with the presence of officers and others in uniform? What are some recommendations of training and so forth. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Neal, for the resource there. <laughs> well, one, and one of the things specific even to this case, this was a great example of uh, that teaming opportunity uh, and collaboration and kind of changing the course of the conversation. Uh, many times this individual uh, had been, you know, uh, involved with first responders, as we had noted, uh, over two years. It was something like 176 times. Uh, so they knew this, family knew this kiddo really well. Uh, and uh, were quite honestly tired and exhausted of responding. Um, but they also were feeling that the family uh, you know, maybe wasn't doing their part, wasn't as receptive to the first responders. Uh, the family wasn't feeling that the first responders were understanding them. And then you have the child in the mix who really didn't understand or nor was he really uh, what he could do and what he should do within that context. So after several cases, situations uh, in which he was brought uh, in front of probation uh, and the family came to talk to probation and then uh, were looking for potentially for uh, placement for this individual, everybody collectively came together uh, we talked a, a great deal, uh, provided some samples, uh, some uh, tools for them, uh, some of the Canvas opportunities, self-paced learning opportunities, but really nuts and bolts we're talking about uh, good communication skills, uh, some proactive ways of engaging with uh, a child in their community that they're going to interface with. Uh, they were interfacing with uh, this child at school because 
uh, at the SRO uh, was not feeling adept enough, and so he would call his colleague, who would then come to the school as well and take him off. Um, so it's training at all of those levels with all of those entities, and really, um, again, meeting people where they're at. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times people want uh, some uh, addressing specific scenarios. So in this case, we know the kiddo really well, uh, being able to talk about those scenarios, how could we do things differently, um, appropriate and effective communication techniques that are going to de-escalate behavior rather than escalate it even further. Um, you know, being able to provide uh, the officers with uh, tangible things that they could ask for from the family when they got to the family home, then working with the family about what they needed to have ready. Uh, so it, it's really, again, that, that community collaboration, networking, consistency, um, and really not one way. Um, the, the interventions we know, but it's really um, being able to put those in the hands of people in a way that they are going to be able to realistically and practically use it. Thank you so much, Dr. Sweezy. And Dr. Neal, thanks so much for the resource on screen here. I, I, if you wouldn't mind just sharing that with me, I'll go ahead and post it on the networking cafe as well. There's some excellent trainings and resources and tools here. We have a wonderful question. Uh, with, a, with a bit of a lead in here. I lead a large behavioral health crisis department in central Indiana. We frequently see patients with high needs related to autism or other intellectual disabilities. The units um, are often not a great fit to admit these patients, but we typically don't have other safe options for patients, specifically youth and adults, especially at night and on weekends. Are there other options uh, for referral or other resource organizations where we can help to meet the needs in real time. Any resources or other recommendations for organizations perhaps within Central Indiana or even uh, hopefully across the state that could be a support? I think there's a, it, there's a combination. It kind of depends on the locale. So that's one of the things that we find that what is present in one community may not be with others. Um, but it's identifying uh, kind of the, the resources so that um, uh, folks can kind of tag team together and maybe think about their roles more creatively. So pulling from uh, DCS and CMHI and BEADS. Uh, the school, respite care, there's all kinds of combinations that we've been able to help effectively put together um, that has ne not necessarily uh, resolved the issue in and of itself, or uh, nor has there been necessarily one location or one type of agency. Um, that would that would be great, but that just doesn't um, it doesn't exist. But it's putting those different ones together. I think some of it's also been that creative problem solving, like Dr. Susie mentioned, in regards to in lieu of a unit or in lieu of um, kind of that crisis response, um, we build out the family support plans and really try to complement those to what may already be in place with the wrap providers or wraparound providers or DCS or other case managers um, to think creatively during those times where we are experiencing high levels of behavior and trying to think proactively in terms of scheduling and other you know, factors in terms of both how to structure the environment or what some of the triggers are, um, but also how can we better augment that? So is there a neighbor? Is there another activity? Is there something that's more preferred that could be supplemented? Um, or if we're looking at providers that have some level of flexibility um, and we're using more of like an FSW type of waiver, are there ways that we could you know, uh, access either different resources or request services during different times? to give us a couple sets of hands to really work through those um, when we can't rely on, on just a unit or just a service because we know there's that shortage. Um, so really trying to, again, facilitate that conversation about what is accessible, what are those targeted times, 
Um, what can we do proactively from a, a skills teaching and a schedule and a structure component? Um, and then also from a staffing, just to really be able to carry out, especially as you mentioned for you know adolescents and adults, since you mentioned the adult piece, um, they are bigger. And so it's a little bit harder than you know, working through with a six-year-old sometimes, um, but in the same regard, trying to think outside of the box when there isn't a go-to unit or that isn't the only resource that's accessible. And I think I, kind of telling along that just briefly is that uh, that family support plan has been a, been a critical piece because part of it is retraining the families and providers, but honestly, to think um, it, there are uh, opportunities in the trajectory. It doesn't have to go from nothing to crisis. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do in between, but in the moment, um, it's going to be hard to think through that. So proactively, we have to um, identify, okay, when we see this particular precursor to the behavior occurring, what is a potential avenue? When we see the next level, what's a potential avenue? And kind of getting a, a plan and a sequence in place where ultimately we may have to look at first responders, we may have to go to the ED, but that's not going to be our first uh, go-to every time. Thank you both, Dr. Neal and Dr. Sweezy, for just the excellent resourcing and literally the live technical assistance that is available on this wonderful website. I know as we continue to probe um, the opportunity to better serve our patients, uh, the intersectionality that uh, they present, and also the opportunities for better understanding of co occurring and especially uh, developmental disabilities in, in composite. Uh, these are, again, wonderful resources and they're just the connection with you both. Um, and we greatly appreciate your time and insights with us today. We will continue to share your incredibly inclusive and um, outreach of information with the team. And so I, I offer for our participants that um, to please reach out to Hands and Autism as a resource as you continue to identify um, areas of opportunity and improvements with service offerings for uh, our patients across the state. This concludes our day one of the Division of Mental Health and Addictions Cultural, Competency, uh, Cultural Linguistic Competency Conference. And we wish you all an excellent evening and we will be back tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. Uh, same access regarding your email agenda, personalized links. The networking cafe is open, so if you would like to continue the conversation, please do virtually and please continue to network and uh, collaborate. Thank you all for a robust day of engagement, and especially to our last presenters of the day, Dr. Sweezy and Dr. Neal. Thank you all. <laughs>